license. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I also work as an associate director of clinical services. Um, I am a part-time professor and I do provide um, supervision to um, registered interns in some states, they're called associates seeking licensure. So that's a little bit about me. And then I'll turn it over to my co-host, Dr. Hernandez. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Hartine. So good morning, everyone, all the way from sunny Florida. <laughs> so I am Dr. Hernandez. I have my PhD in marriage and family therapy. Um, and I actually work for Goodman Jewish Family Services. So most of my practice pretty much uh, correlates with a lot of couples, a lot of families, but I do hold self-care dear to my heart. It's something that I constantly practice. It's something that I'm constantly telling my clients to practice because it's absolutely necessary on an everyday basis. So we are here to present to you on self-care and we are excited to get this party started. So before we jump into the presentation, I know most of you have your cameras off and that's okay, but if you can either use the raise your hand function, thumbs up, type in the chat, if any of you have experienced stress in let's say the last week or the last two weeks, either stress or some sort of, um, I already see something in the chat, but some sort of uh, not so happy feelings. Okay, so I'm getting some yes, absolutely. Yes. Stress, frustration. All right. So the great news is that you are in the best place possible because we're trying to get you from wherever you are to success. So we're going to jump right in and get started. So just so you have an idea of what we will be doing today, we will be going over the learning objectives. Um, we're going to do a mental health check-in activity. We're going to talk about mental health um, specifically for um, counseling students and professionals in the counseling field pre-COVID and then what their mental health looks like Post-COVID, we're going to do a mental health symptoms activity, and then we're going to go into the fun part, uh, self-care. So we're going to define self-care. Um, we're going to go into a self-care inventory, go into self-care strategies, and then do two different activities, one of which is positive affirmations. The other one is a, a breathing activity, and then we're going to wrap up. Now, as far as expectations, there are as expectations for you all, but don't be afraid. They are very simple. The first one is just to be present. So just, just be here, be in this moment, join us, um, take in the information and participate. So we don't want this to be a, we're talking at you sort of thing. I'm, so, I'm sure that if you're students, that probably happens a lot. If you're already practicing, maybe that happens a lot when you're in supervision or when you're with clients. Um, so we just, we want this to be very collaborative. We want it to be conversation. So whenever you see this little pop-up, you can feel free to either unmute yourself. You can also type in the chat, however it is that you want to communicate with us. Um, but again, always feel free if you have a question, if you have a comment, if there's something that you want to share, please do so. Perfect. So a little bit about the learning objectives. So this is what we hope that you all will get from our presentation. So participants will be able to recognize at least two signs of negative mental health effects due to COVID-19 pandemic develop their own definition of self-care, learn at least one mental health check-in tool, take away at least one mental health resource to help in times of stress, and identify at least one self-care strategy to help them work towards an ideal work-life balance. So first, we're going to start with a mental health check-in activity. So I'm gonna ask you all, wherever you are, to get comfortable. Maybe you wanna move your shoulders a little bit. You wanna move your head a little bit. 
Um, if you're laying down and you have your camera off, then that's perfect. Um, just get yourself in a comfortable position. If you are okay with this, you can either close your eyes or you can lower your gaze. And we're gonna do collective breathing. Um, we're gonna do just three breaths. So I am going to lead it. Now, once you're in a comfortable position and either eyes closed or lowered gaze, I want you to breathe in and breathe out and breathe in and breathe out. And one more time, breathe in and breathe out. Now I want you to stay there for a moment almost do a scan from your mind all the way down to your chest, to your legs, to your feet. Is there anything that stands out? Are there any thoughts that come to mind? Are there any physical sensations that come to mind? And with that, um, we have this ladder and it shows different numbers of where you can potentially be. Um, you could find yourself at one number or maybe you're at a, a combination of two. Like for example, I will say that I right now, I'm in between feeling okay and doing pretty good. And I will say I'm doing pretty good because I'm presenting on something I am passionate about and I'm with you all. So that's very exciting. Um, if anyone wants to share um, what number they're at, if you feel comfortable doing that? Well, I would definitely say that I'm feeling okay. And also I'm doing pretty good, but I would say just as you said, presentation. <laughs> so that's so, something that's super. I'm getting a seven, it could be better. Eight, we have two eights and a smiley face. That's good. Um, for the participant who's at a seven, hopefully by the time we finish this, you will be at a 7.5 maybe an eight, I see a five, I have no idea how I feel, and that's totally fine. So a lot of the things we're gonna teach you today are gonna help you understand yourself, um, understand what your needs are, what it is that you're feeling, and then how you can best attend to yourself. And I wanna thank everyone that was uh, brave enough to participate and to share where you are. And I do want to say that there is no wrong answer. Um, it, we, are, we feel how we feel. Um, but I will say there are things that we can do to help ourselves, which is part of this presentation. So we will keep on moving. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Harkin. So I'm going to talk a little bit on some research that has to do with mental health pre-COVID and post-COVID. So, as you can see, there's a couple of items that's listed on the screen for you. There's benefits and hardships of internship during pandemic, importance of boundaries, attending to self-care, desire for enhanced support for professional communities. Now, all of this is actually part of a study that I researched. It's centered on a quality of study on marriage and family therapists and recent professionals who graduated with their master's in Seattle. So the aim of the study was to see any meaningful experiences during the early stage of COVID-19 pandemic. So surveys were provided and themes were uncovered. So I'm gonna go through each and every one of them. And if anyone has any questions, you can always comment or you can share. So for the first one, benefits and hardships of internship during pandemic. So there was found to be an increase in creativity when utilizing telehealth services due to clients not being in front of the clinician. So with that being said, a lot of the clinicians that were in front of clients had to get used to being in front of a screen also. So lots of the programs that we were part of didn't necessarily teach us how to be in the moment with our clients in front of a screen like we are at this moment in time. So lots of the interventions, lots of the coping skills, all these things had to be redacted to fit the mold that was happening back in 2020. Participants also found themselves worried for providing adequate care to their clients and an increase of burnout due to providing telehealth services. 
So lots of us tended to lead to a lot of higher stress in reading clients because there wasn't much non-verbal cues. So as you can see, all you have right now, this moment in time is seeing me from this half to the top half, and I don't even know if this is right. <laughs> but that's a lot. A lot as a therapist is seeing what the client is doing in sessions, such as seating positions, such as how they're um, behaving in session, not just what's coming out of their mouths verbally. And students and professionals had higher expectations of themselves and their performance as clinicians during that time. So as far as the next one, importance of boundaries, there was a lot during the research that stated that there was difficulty in detaching from work while working from home. So a lot of the times from what I saw, even including with students I supervised, many of them stated that it was very difficult to create a location and a space in their home during the COVID pandemic. So what that means is location is everything, right? So when we work from home, we aim to work somewhere that's going to make us feel comfortable. So we had what the kitchen barge stool, we had the living room, we have the dining room, we have our home office if we had one even. And lots of the times it created kind of like an enmeshment where we had to constantly be everywhere with work even after the hours. So that made it more difficult to separate work from home in itself. Lots of students and professionals commented on that. And having a set time working was also something difficult. So a lot of us have nine to five jobs, some of us work a little bit later, but during the pandemic, lots of the research suggests that many of the participants ended their jobs at five or 6 p.m. But what ended up happening is that we ended up having to work at six or seven because we had that client that canceled us on us at 3 p.m. and said, do you have a later time? And we said, yes, we do. Because there was more uh, leniency. We had more access to clients with this telehealth service. So that was leading to a lot of burnout. That was leading to a lot of higher stress levels during COVID. Now, one of the things that really did increase was attending to self-care surprisingly enough on a positive note a lot of the participants in the study stated that self-care was extremely important individuals commented on the need for self-care and carving out some space and time which contributed to um, more connection with their client so i know dr harkin is going to highlight a couple of these wonderful tools and items that she has later on but some of the things that were highlighted in the article was how students were able to have small breaks or end their work day without touching their computers for the rest of the night during COVID and finding creative means to reduce stress during the pandemic. So I, for one, especially became a chef. <laughs> I became a baker. I don't know if many of you did, but I seriously did. I even attempted to do and bake some bread <laughs> later on. Didn't go as planned. <laughs> But that was something that I was able to do, at least to create some sort of self-care in my daily routine, especially during COVID. So the last one I want to highlight is desire for enhanced support for professional communities. So I don't know if any of you have felt this or currently feel this, but working from home, especially during the pandemic, it felt isolating at times and it also felt lonely. This was something, a theme that was highlighted within the study. So lots of the students and lots of the clinicians stated that there was no one around to debrief after a session they had. Students and professionals wanted to be able to walk into their supervisor's office, discuss a case and feel like they handled a case well, but oftentimes found themselves unable to do so. That's one of the things that was a little bit difficult for them. Now, I'm not stating that they didn't have support. They just wanted a little bit more, especially feeling connected to their supervisors and peers. And lastly, technology difficulties. I don't know if any of you have any difficulties with technology, but I most certainly do. I'm not an expert in computers whatsoever. I didn't get my PhD in that for sure. But many of the people who participated in the study were not as equipped to go through technological difficulties. And that contributes to higher stress. It contributes to lots of individuals feeling inadequate during sessions and trying to get it situated 10, 15 minutes after session was supposed to start with the client. 
So we're going to move forward to mental health post COVID-19. So the first one I'm going to highlight is for students and then we're going to work our way over to professionals. So for this specific study, a lot of the study was to examine the intersection of COVID-19 with fear and mental health consequences among college students in Northern Michigan. So it was conducted during the pandemic and it was also conducted two years after in 2022 with 151 students who participated. So for the findings, there was, I guess, a debrief. There was a five item brief symptom rating scale, also known as BSRS5, which was used to screen psychological disorders. It measures anxiety, feeling tense or high strung, depression, feeling depressed or in a low mood, hostility, feeling easily annoyed or irritated, interpersonal sensitivity, feeling inferior to others, and additional sleep symptoms, having trouble falling asleep in the past week. Interestingly enough, 95.7 of the participants within the study developed moderate to severe mood disorders post COVID-19. So what that research suggested was that happiness levels in particular participants significantly decreased. There was a lot more depressive symptoms that was highlighted post COVID than there was before and happiness levels, which was also assessed during the uh, article or the research was significantly higher before. One of the things I wanna highlight is academic distress, which is something that was spoken about. So it was needing to navigate their way in school with new policies after two years of COVID, students still needed to figure out what these new policies were, how to navigate them, and the additional virtual classes and how to navigate that. Finding some similar support with their peers and professors was another highlight, and all of which impacted students' grades and academic performance. So one thing also was a moderate and substantial increases in social anxiety. So during the pandemic, I want you to think back a little bit. A lot was shut down, right? People did not have to socialize with each other face to face. Now, with everything open again, people have to learn to socialize once more with others due to the increase of isolation during the pandemic. That was major because a lot of the times people tend to disconnect, isolate themselves. And most of the time people were on social media. That was one of the things that uh, was highlighted within the research. So imagine there's an increase in depressive symptoms. And because of that increase, there came family distress, not spending enough time with people, family, again, isolation, and also came the eating concerns due to increases of that depression. So eating too much or eating too little as a means to cope. So we're going to move on to the professional section. And I will also add that with family distress, um, it could also be that maybe you were spending too much time with your family. Um, it could be that you were cooped up. Let's say there were multiple family members living under one household, um, and that could also create distress. Um, so both the separation, but also the Together constantly myself. being around each other, almost like in a caged environment, um, created distress. So right. now Dr. Hernandez will go over the what the professionals experienced. Thank you, Dr. Hakeem. So for this particular study, it was an online survey assessing financial, social, mental health impact of COVID-19 on professionals in New Jersey and New York. So I want you to think for a second, Sample size, it was 4,714 participants that participated in this online survey. So I'm going to tell you the percentage of each sample in those findings. So increased stress and anxiety, it was found that 76% of 4,714 participants had stress and anxiety after COVID-19. Also 63% of the sample had increased worry for health of others and self. So a lot of people, even two years later, were still concerned with COVID-19. A lot of people are afraid that they might contract something and give it to one of their loved ones 
or maybe one of the loved ones who already has an immunocompromised system and something might happen and they might blame themselves and might develop certain guilt. 68% of the sample had disrupted sleeping patterns. So that's sleeping too much, sleeping too little, or waking up throughout the night. That's a lot out of 4,714. 81% of the sample had difficulty in concentrating. Imagine that, remaining present in a session with the client, 81% of the sample. 49% of the sample had financial distress or loss of a job. Now, if we think back, especially uh, during COVID-19. A lot of things were shut down, agencies, organizations, and some clinicians were able to get their jobs back. Other clinicians were unable to get those jobs back. And they're still trying to make their way through their finances in trying to find something that's going to be stable. And some jobs even cut certain hours and they're not able to meet those needs. 83% of the sample also became more frustrated with life circumstances or boredom. And interestingly enough, 74% of the sample developed depressive symptoms, similar to the students that we just spoke about. So that's a lot counting. So that tells me, and hopefully it tells each of you that self-care is most definitely needed, even in today's world. <laughs> so. Okay. Before we move on, um, I know we've presented a lot of information to you, but I'm curious to see, because I imagine we have a mix of students, professionals, maybe others, but if you can type in yes, you don't have to tell us exactly which one applies to you. You could do a thumbs up, but does any of this resonate with you? Um, did you personally experience any of this or do you know someone who potentially experienced this? So I'm going through, I'm seeing um, thumbs up and I'm seeing yeses in the chat. Okay, so it seems like, oh, yes to all. Thank you for your open, your openness. Okay, so this, it seems like really resonates with a lot of you, okay. So basically, even though there's limited research, it seems like the liter the research is spot on to what a lot of us experience. Um, so now we are going to do an activity where we are going to present symptoms and you we want you to guess what they are. So I'm going to put, um, the symptoms that you have to guess. So it is depression, stress, anxiety. And the reason why we chose to highlight these symptoms is because these are the ones that seemed most prevalent um, post COVID. Um, th this is something that it seems that across the board, everyone was experiencing, whether it was in the counseling field, outside of the counseling field. Um, and sometimes, uh, we, we, I like to call them warning signs. Our bodies gives us warning signs, just like cars give us warning signs when it's time for maintenance or something needs to be done. But we tend to think that maybe if we take a pill or if we do this, you know, it's gone, we're good and we can keep going. Um, but what we don't realize is that it's telling there's something else. It's telling us something more. And so I think it's important to increase that awareness. Um, and sometimes we don't even know that these symptoms that are coming up are related to a specific diagnosis. So we're gonna play this game. You can either unmute yourself or you can type in the chat which one you think I'm talking about. So the first one, the symptoms are excessive worrying, feeling tense all the time, um, experiencing agitation, anger, irritability, intolerance of uncertainty, which I'm sure a lot of us felt during COVID, worry about situations and or events, over planning, desire to control people and or events, clenching jaw and sleep disturbances. As Dr. Hernandez described, it can be sleeping more, sleeping less, problems sleeping throughout the night, so someone said over planning, I see stress. Okay, so for those of you who said anxiety, 
You are correct. This is anxiety. I'm going to give you the keywords because some of them you're going to see overlap. Excessive worrying, um, over planning, desire to control people or and or events. So that desire to control comes from anxiety because anxiety is when you're worried, when you feel like you don't have control. So you want to have control, even though control is something that we think we have, but in reality, we don't have. Um, worry about situation and or events, uncertainty. So all of these are like key words for anxiety. Now we're gonna go on to the next one. Difficulty concentrating, constant worry, aches and pains, chest pain, lowered immune system, agitation and or unable to relax, moodiness, short-tempered and or irritable, feeling overwhelmed, eating more and or less, sleeping too much and or little. Stress, stress. Okay, so everyone is on it. Yes, you are correct. So the answer is stress. And again, you will see that some symptoms overlap. For example, there's constant worry, there's um, sleep disturbances, but this is what I wanna highlight. The stress, um, it really impacts the way that you function. It impacts who you are. Let's say you're happy-go-lucky or, or you're more like a neutral person, but then all of a sudden you're moody. Maybe you're lashing out at people. I will self-disclose and say, even though I'm a therapist, I'm a human and I have had certain moments where I've lashed out and then I feel bad. Um, so that happens, feeling overwhelmed, um, agitation, unable to relax. Again, that is stress. And we need to be very careful because if you experience chronic stress, because for example, stress, one time, okay, you know, that's fine. Stress comes with life. But when it starts to become chronic, when this starts to happen day after day after day, and this becomes most of your day, this can lead to, lead to burnout, which you do not want. So those are some of the key symptoms from stress. And now I feel like this one is kind of obvious, but we're gonna go over it anyway. So there's energy loss. So maybe you don't have enough energy to do the things that you were doing before. Maybe you get tired more easily, changes in appetite. So again, it could be that you're eating less, sleep problems. You could be sleeping more. You could be sleeping less. No concentration, social withdrawal. So imagine isolation, almost like you're a turtle and you're retreating into your shell. Um, uh, helplessness, so that feeling of like, no matter what I do, I'm just going to be here. So imagine it almost like a black hole, increased apathy. So what that means is you're no longer doing the things that you were interested in. So let's say you love to paint, you love to dance, you like going to the gym, you like hanging out with friends, you're no longer doing any of that. None of that causes your attention. You don't want to do it. You're emotionally distant. So again, you're retreating. You're not talking to others. You're just keeping to yourself, feeling tired all the time, neglecting responsibilities. So um, maybe you start showing up late to work. You're not showering. You're not, um, uh, I don't know if you're someone who likes putting on makeup and you stop doing that. Um, you're not eating properly, you're missing some meals. Let me see what's in the chat, depression. Yes, yeah, so this is depression. And as we can see, there's some slight overlap, but what we're talking about here, some major ones are energy loss, social withdrawal, helplessness, apathy, being emotionally different, neglecting responsibilities and or just your basic needs. Um, that would be depression. And again, if you feel comfortable, if you want to say yes, that maybe these are some of the experiences that you had during COVID, post COVID. Um, I can tell you that I experienced two out of three of these. I know that anxiety was an, an issue for me. Stress was an issue for me. 
um, that was really tough. I, the, the pandemic honestly was, was very tough. Um, I don't know if there's any thumbs up or hands I'm going through. Okay. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide and we're gonna talk about self-care. So the way I like to view self-care is it's almost like an antidote, um, but I, I view self-care as both something preventative, but also as an intervention. And what I mean by that is that, let's say you are thriving, you are amazing at life, you're just winning, and you know, anxiety is pretty low, stress is really low, depression maybe is non-existent for you and you're just winning at life. Um, you, I still encourage you to practice self-care so that you can stay at that level and um, you, know, the, you stay great. The way that I like to think about, about it as intervention is, let's say you do have some levels of anxiety, you do have some levels of depression, um, and so you want to you want to improve your well being. So we're going to present some self care strategies that you can do. That way, you can get back to your regular. I like to think of it in a, an analogy is like you have a car and you're filling the gas tank. Or if you're into video games, you have a life bar and you're filling that life bar. This is what self-care is. So self-care, at least in the mental health field, has become a buzzword and it's all the rave right now. Everyone loves to talk about self-care. So I want you to either unmute yourself or type in the chat what you think self-care is. And I will, I'll give you a hint, it's in the name. So if you pay attention to the name, it'll, it, it's gonna tell you what self-care is. So if anyone wants to take a guess, we promise you're not gonna be judged. Caring for yourself, doing activities to cope with stress, doing small or large activities, to take care of self. I find that one really interesting and I'm gonna speak on that. So thank you all who participated. So um, I'm gonna read some definitions that I really liked. So self-care is the practice of taking action to preserve or improve one's own health. So the key words here are taking action and preserving or improving one's health. The other definition I liked is the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness, in particular during times of stress. So the reason why I like both of these definitions is because, again, you are an active participant in self-care. Um, and also, this is something that either you can do to maintain or protect your, you know, your current level of well-being, or you can improve it. And with the second definition, what I like is that it implies that this is something that you can do always, but they highlight that this is especially important when you are stressed. Um, and so I, in some cultures, I will continue to self-disclose. I am Latina, and in our culture, it's a very much, you have to be strong, um, there's no like emotions, like what is that? You know, you just have to keep on going. There is no impossible. You just need to make things happen. Um, and sometimes it can be viewed as you're being selfish. If you're taking care of yourself, well, my computer is just acting on its own. Okay. Um, and so what I wanted to say about that is that self-care is not selfish. It's actually necessary. So again, if we go back to that analogy of a car, um, what's gonna happen if you're on an empty gas tank? What's gonna happen then? Is the car gonna be able to do anything? I don't think so. So it's necessary to get, to get gas because if not, you can't do anything, especially if um, you are a parent, you are a partner, you have dependents, even if you don't, 
that you have a relationship with yourself. Um, you are your own dependent. So you need to make sure that you are caring for yourself so that you can attend to all of your responsibilities. Um, so I really, really want to highlight that. And then something else I want to highlight is that self-care sh should be sustainable. So I want you to keep sustainability in mind. Someone mentioned doing large or small activities. I feel like in the mainstream media, um, self-care is marketed as these grand things that require time, that require money. They're th these like large activities. But really, we're going to show you self-care from a different perspective, one that is sustainable, one that is simple, one that is practical, that you can incorporate seamlessly into your life. So now we're going to do a self-care inventory, but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to show us your answers. So you can either think about this in your mind, you can write it down if you want. Um, but the statements I'm going to show you come from a larger self-care inventory, and I can share that link if anyone is interested. So essentially, I'm going to present some statements to you, and you're going to answer them on your own um, with either frequently, occasionally, rarely, or never. So eat regularly. And what they mean by that is at least three meals. So breakfast, lunch, dinner. Is this something that you do frequently, occasionally, rarely, or never? Um, now, there are a series of activities here, but you can just insert the one that you like. Um, dance, swim, walk, run, play sports, sing, or do some other physical activity that is enjoyable to me, get enough sleep, let me start that one, especially for adults, spend quality time with loved ones and or friends, allow time for reflection, participate in a spiritual community, this is if it is applicable to you, meditate or pray if it is applicable to you. And this one, I want you to start as well, whether you're a student or a professional, take breaks when needed. Now, um, something I will ask, if you feel comfortable sharing, notice if there's a theme. If, if you frequently do these things, great job, keep doing it. But I'm curious about if anyone, for anyone, it was occasionally, rarely, or never. Did you find that there was a theme of you occasionally, rarely, or never doing these things? Okay, I don't see any reactions, nothing in the chat. Okay, yes, occasionally came up. So amazing, amazing if you're doing this occasionally. I see a few, so it sounds like you all are doing well and I would keep up whatever it is that you're doing. That's awesome. Okay. So now we're going to get into self-care strategies. So I broke this down into different types of self-care strategies because we have different aspects of, that make us who we are. Um, so in terms of physical um, resting, I know that that sounds kind of like duh, but um, I would like to know how many of us actually rest. How many of us actually, when we feel like we need to rest, rest, we rest. Because sometimes we can have those guilty feelings like, oh, but I should be doing X, I should be doing Y, or, you know, someone asked me to do this. And, and you know, we let those, I, de I, see, I see a hand. Thank you for that hand. Um, so yes, rest, what is that? Exactly. So, rest, that's not. <laughs> exactly. So, and I want to, I want to break it down even further because it doesn't have to be like you're resting for hours. It can be that you say, you know what, like I'm very overwhelmed right now. I'm going to set a timer for five minutes or five, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is. I'm just going to relax. And then I'm going to get back into what I'm doing. I promise you those five, 10, 15 minutes, that's not going to harm you. It's going to help you. Another one is going on walks. So here's a, a, another brief snippet of my life. My mother loves going on walks. And when I lived with her, um, I would go with her, but it was like begrudgingly. And I was like, oh, 
I live in Florida. It's hot. It's humid. I don't want to go on a walk. Uh, you know, it's my mom, so I'm going to go on a walk. Now, as an adult, um, it's funny because I have now started to go on walks and I do it by myself. Um, and now I wish my mom was with me so we could walk together and talk and spend time together. But what my point is, is that believe it or not, there's a lot of benefits to walking. It helps you reset. It helps you clear your mind. A change in scenery does you very well. So maybe you can walk for five minutes. Maybe if you have a balcony or you have a porch or you have a backyard, you can just step outside, be there for a few minutes, go back in. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to that. And again, this is something that doesn't have to be time consuming. You don't have to plan it in advance. It doesn't have to take hours. It doesn't have to take money. Um, but this is very beneficial to you. Stretching, um, it's important to stretch sleeping who can tell me a guess of how many hours adult ad, adults are supposed to get um of sleep a night who can tell me seven to eight perfect six to eight yes you are spot on how many of us actually get the minimum of six so i'm just putting it bare minimum how many of us get the bare minimum of six hours I personally do, but that's because I'm, I'm, that is my self care. Okay. Someone else does. Perfect. Amazing. That's great. Now I do want to say, okay, maybe once a week, occasionally I try to sleep. Hygiene is really important. That can be a, another presentation in itself, but essentially what it means is that you're setting up a routine for your sleep. So again, if we think about it, we're like, huh, childhood when my mom used or my dad or my caregiver my guardian used to tell me oh it's time to start getting ready for bed it's time to brush your teeth it's time to wash your face okay now you're going to go into bed lights out so basically it's like we're going back into childhood you want that sleep hygiene and i will um honor those who have sleep issues for example i have sleep issues so maybe you need to take some um, vitamins some supplements maybe even talk to a doctor, a psychiatrist, if maybe those don't work for you, you need actual um, sleeping aids. Um, there is no shame in that, whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you believe in, uh, try to make sure to get your sleep. Um, and then finally, there is eating. Um, I will again self-disclose, sometimes I get so busy, so into my work, and I just work all the way through and I forget to take breaks, I forget to eat. Um, my friend, she she's a therapist as well. She works specifically with eating disorders. And she mentioned that setting alarms is something helpful. So maybe if it gets to that point where you have to set an alarm so that you can remind yourself to eat, it's very important. Meal prepping, that's something that helps as well. You know, you can already have the food ready. All you do is heat it up. But eating is very important. So now we're going to go into emotional self-care. Um, so stress management, anything that helps you, whether it's watching cat videos, browsing TikTok, I personally don't have TikTok, but maybe like going on TikTok for five minutes, um, calling a friend, calling a loved one, humor, again, watching funny videos, talking to someone who makes you laugh, it helps break down all that tension and resets positive affirmations, gratitude and kindness. Something I wanna highlight here is that I'm sure you all are amazing people. I'm sure you all have the biggest hearts. You're so kind, you're so gracious with others, so appreciative. Now, my question to you is, do you show that same kindness and gratitude to yourself? No, I got a nope right away. Okay, so. Here's my saying, I, in my work, something I, I work on a lot is in clients showing more kindness and gratitude to themselves. So the way that you treat others, you wanna treat yourself. So we don't think about it, but we actually have relationships with ourselves. And it's like, what, we do? Yes, we have a relationship with ourselves. So that little voice inside your head, if you have one, start paying attention to what it's saying. And if it's telling you negative things, you wanna stop it. 
and you want to reframe what it's telling you. You want to bring in more compassion. You want to bring in more humanity. You want to honor your experience as a human being. Mistakes are a part of life. It's learning, it's growth. And you want to um, be grateful for the things that you do for yourself, whether it's you went on a short walk, you talked to someone you love, you took a break and you're so proud of yourself. You know, you did something amazing. You're proud of yourself. Make sure to highlight those, mo those moments, those sparkling moments. Now, I'm going to go over this quickly because of time, but um, we came up with some sample affirmations that we felt are applicable to both um, students and professionals. The great part about positive affirmations is that you can make them up. You don't have to follow anyone's. You make your own ones. Um, so the, some examples I'll read is when I practice, I see great results. When I put forth more effort, I improve. And my absolute favorite, I am capable of doing difficult things. Without serving the room, I can imagine that many of us here have probably not only done one difficult thing in their lives, but have gone through many, many very difficult things in their lives. Um, and there's many more that you can go through. So that's not to say that the difficult moments are not going to suck. It's not to say that they're not going to be hard, it's not to say that negative emotions won't come up. It's to say that you have that strength, you can get through it. It is difficult, but you can do it. And now we're going to go over um, social self-care strategies because we are social being boundaries so how many of you raise your hand or type in the chat if you have issues with boundaries maybe you're a yes person you're a super person you can do it all and anytime someone asks you for help or asks you for something you're like yep yes i'm there i can do it um yes sometimes okay i will tell you that's me but recently i have started to scale back on that so boundaries is not a bad thing it's a way for you to teach others how to treat you. It's a way for you to honor yourself. Um, and we need to keep in mind that with boundaries, we're not being mean. It's not like you're being mean, you're saying no. There's different ways to set boundaries. Um, and I encourage you to Google different ways to say them, but it's very important for you to set boundaries because you are taking care of yourself. You're honoring yourself when you do this. Asking for help, again, in my culture, you're supposed to do it all. You know, it, it's asking for help, like what, what is that? But um, if you have hopefully a support network, you have, let's say a partner, a family member, a friend, you know, someone that you know is there for you that you can definitely count on. Please, please, please ask for help when you, when you can, um, need to. There's no shame in that. We cannot do everything, that just is what it is. And when you ask for help, again, you're honoring yourself. Now support systems, um, I wanna extend it beyond family, loved ones, friends. Sometimes I, I've talked to people who are inst in institutions where unfortunately um, they're almost like outcasts or outsiders. They don't have someone in their direct work environment um, that they feel like they can have that connection with. My encouragement to you is to turn to social media, turn to uh, technology. Um, with COVID, there's been a lot of advancement. Um, something great is, for example, Facebook groups. Um, you can find different people who maybe they have similar experiences to you and you can become great friends and that can become um, a support network for you. Disconnecting, I know we're talking about supporting, but think about how much time we spend on our phones, watching TV on a laptop like we're doing right now in front of a screen. If you pick an hour of one day for one week or maybe half an hour to just of your phone off put it away and just be it's gonna make all the difference it's almost like an emotional detox um and finally time together so that's time together with loved ones um because of covid um maybe you can't do it face to face so if you do a facetime a phone call um now spiritual this is if it applies to you and this can also be religion 
spending time alone. I personally am someone that I need a time to reset. I'm an introvert. So after I've spent time with a lot of people or doing a lot of talking, I need time alone. So giving yourself that time. Reflection. I love to reflect. If that's something that you're not into, that's okay. Meditation or prayer, if that's something that speaks to you. Volunteering for a cause. Maybe you don't have time. You can donate money um, to a cause that, that you believe in. Um, attending a place of worship. Again, times have changed, so you can do that in person. You can do it via Zoom or other technologies. Um, and then finally, during online learning or work, um, the ones that I'm going to highlight are creating a consistent routine that actually really helps. Taking breaks. I know a lot of you have a hard time taking breaks, but again, it can be five minutes. It can be two minutes. Just put that timer on, close your eyes, or just walk around, do what you need to do, and then go back to it. Schedule self-care time. So that could be five minutes in the morning, phone off, you're sipping your tea, sipping your coffee, whatever you like to drink in the morning. It can be something as simple as that. Remembering to stay hydrated, remembering to eat. Um, and finally, resting your eyes, stretching. I am someone who's, who's sitting in this position all day, every day. Um, it'll do your body wonders if you do a quick, just like it's shown there, you know, stretching your arms, your shoulders, your neck, your head, you get up, you touch your toes. Um, we've already talked about most of these, but one that I want to highlight is adjusting expectations. Um, so a lot of us, again, we're superstars, we're super people, we we want to do everything. We want it to do it the best of our abilities. So it's important to, again, practice patience, gratitude, kindness, compassion, be very realistic, be okay if sometimes we have to lower expectations. Um, it's about what we can really do, honoring ourselves, letting ourselves do that. This is a breathing technique, um, but my Instagram is up there if you want to take a look. Unfortunately, we don't have time for this, but um, it's pretty simple. You can do it on your own. All right, so are there any questions or comments that anyone will have? If you do, put it in the chat. And if not, thank you. <laughs> you can unmute yourself as well. Um, so you can either unmute yourself, you can type in the chat, Our information is up there in case um, you want to connect after, um, in case you have any questions, anything that comes up to you after. I have a question now. Yes. Um, the question is regarding the comment section of the previous class that we took, and it asks for a password. Um, I'm trying to enter what I think I would have used for the password and it's not allowing me to get in. So who do I get in contact with about that? Hi, hi that Frida. You can, oh. um, you can email the office of CE at the Chicago school.edu and we'll get back with you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll put that in the chat too. All right, perfect. So if there's no other questions, then we thank you all so much. And we hope that this presentation has given you some tools for self-care. And if you ever need to reach out to us for anything whatsoever, including self-care techniques or any sort of interventions, our information is listed right there and we'll be more than happy to assist. Thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You. All right, take care. Thank you both. Um, just want a quick shout out. Thank you. I'm just south of you in Miami. So good oh, to see you both. I was born and raised in Miami. <laughs> I was like, good to see you both. So gracias por todo. Have a nice day. De nada. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Yes. Bye, guys. Take Bye. Care.